Well, well, well. Shopping for a car? Yep. Carvana made financing a car as smooth as can be. Oh, yeah? I got pre-qualified instantly and had real terms personalized just for me. Hmm. Doesn't get much smoother than that. Well, I got to browse thousands of car options on Carvana, all within my budget. Doesn't get much smoother than that. It does. I actually wanted a car that seemed out of my range, but I was able to add a cosigner and found my dream car. It doesn't get much... Oh, it gets smoother. It's getting delivered tomorrow. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get pre-qualified today. Shop the Plato's Closet Black Friday event in North Charleston and West Ashley and let the deals begin. You know Plato's Closet always has a huge selection of trendy recycled styles at amazing prices, but Black Friday deals are different. They're better. We've been holding back some of our best inventory, and you won't want to miss our Black Friday event. Save on gently used styles from Patagonia, Lululemon, Lily Pulitzer, and hundreds of popular brands. Plato's Closet is ready to let the Black Friday deals begin. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 103, for broadcast on the 30th of September, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, new and puzzling features discovered in already mysterious fast radio bursts. NASA's InSight lander is its first meteoroid impacts on Mars. And Rocket Lab launches its seventh electron mission to orbit this year. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected strange, never before seen characteristics originating from an already mysterious object known as a fast radio burst. Fast radio bursts are sudden ephemeral blasts lasting just a nanosecond, but releasing more energy in that time than our sun releases in an entire year. The explosions occur at very specific wavelengths, and usually at cosmic distances in the spiral arms of distant galaxies. The first fast radio burst was discovered in 2007 in data from the Parkes Radio Telescope in far western New South Wales. Since then, hundreds more have been detected. Interestingly, the first bursts were all singular events, occurring once at a specific location and then never again. And that suggests they were being caused by some sort of cataclysmic event such as a supernova. But astronomers then began detecting fast radio bursts that repeated from the same location. That suggests a different cause. Right now, the leading contender is a highly magnetized neutron star called a magnetar, but feeding black holes and glitching neutron stars haven't been totally ruled out yet either. What all this means is that there could be two separate causes for these mysterious deep space blasts. Or it could simply be that all fast radio bursts are repeaters, with some being a lot more active than others. Now, a report in the journal Nature details some unexpected new observations from a series of fast radio bursts which are challenging science's prevailing understanding of the physical nature and central engine powering these events. The observations were made last year using China's FAST, or 500-metre Aperture Spherical Radio Telescope, together with the giant 10-metre Keck telescopes atop a Mauna Kea in Hawaii. The authors detected 1,863 fast radio bursts over the space of just 82 hours in 54 days, all coming from what appears to be the same active fast radio burst source, catalogued as FRB 2020-1124A. What makes the latest observation so surprising to scientists is the irregular short-time variations in the so-called Faraday rotation measure, which is the strength of the magnetic field and density of particles in the vicinity of the fast radio burst source. The variations went up and down over a period of 36 days of observations and then suddenly dropped during the last 18 days before the source quenched. It's the largest sample of fast radio burst data with polarization information from one single source and reveals a complex, dynamically evolving magnetized environment, which isn't straightforwardly expected from an isolated source. Of course, the most likely explanation is that something else, such as a binary companion star, could be in the vicinity of the fast radio burst engine. Still, the observations are leaving scientists questioning what they thought they knew about these enigmatic objects. Studies authors say the observations brought them back to the drawing board and more multi-wavelength observational campaigns are now needed to further unveil the nature of these objects. This is Space Time. Still to come, 
NASA's InSight lander picks up the sound of meteorite impacts on the surface of Mars, and Rocket Lab launches its seventh Electron mission this year. All that and more still to come on Space Time. It's been confirmed that NASA's Mars InSight lander has detected seismic waves coming from four asteroids which crashed under the red planet's surface in 2020 and 2021. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, represent the first meteor impacts heard on the surface of another planet. InSight landed in the Elysian Planitia region of the red planet in 2018. The meteor impacts in 20 and 21 were the first detected by InSight seismometer since touchdown. Their seismic and acoustic information provide scientists with a new way of studying the Martian crust, mantle and core. One of the study's authors, Ingrid Dubois from Brown University, says the impacts range from between 85 and 290 kilometres from InSight's location. Later, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft flew over the impact sites and it detected a series of new craters right where the impacts occurred. Of the four confirmed meteoroids, Dubois says the first made the most dramatic entrance, hitting the Martian atmosphere on September 5, 2021 and exploding into at least three shards that each left craters behind. When Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter flew over the estimated impact site to confirm the location, it used its black and white context camera to reveal three darkened spots on the red planet's surface. After locating these spots, the orbiter's mission managers used the high-resolution imaging science experiment camera to get a colour close-up of the craters. Then, after combing through earlier data, the InSight team confirmed three other impacts on May the 27th, 2020, February the 18th, 2021, and August the 31st, 2021. Dubois says that having a really precise location for the source of the impacts calibrates all the other data for the mission. It validates the estimates made and tells a lot about the impact process itself and the seismic results. Researchers have been puzzling over why they haven't detected more meteorite impacts on Mars. See, the red planet's located right next to the solar system's main asteroid belt, which provides an ample supply of space rocks to scar the Martian surface. And because the red planet's atmosphere is just 1% as thick as Earth's, far more meteoroids pass through it without disintegrating. Moreover, InSight's seismometer has already detected well over 1,300 Mars quakes, some of which could have been caused by impact events. InSight's team suspects that other impacts may have been obscured by noise from wind or seasonal changes in the atmosphere. And in case you're wondering, here's what the impact sounds like. Now that the distinctive seismic signature of an impact on Mars has been discovered, scientists expect to find more of them hiding within InSight's nearly four years' worth of data. Most Mars quakes are caused by subsurface rocks cracking from heat and pressure. Studying how the resulting seismic waves change as they move through different material provides scientists with a way of studying the Martian crust, mantle and core. The four impacts confirmed so far all produce small quakes with a magnitude of no more than about two. So they're not providing scientists with a glimpse deeper than the Martian crust, whereas seismic signals from larger Mars quakes, such as the magnitude 5 trembler that occurred back in May this year, can reveal significant details about the planet's mantle and core. Also, these particular impacts were all relatively close by, so their signals didn't go through the mantle or core anyway but it allows scientists to use this knowledge for the whole catalogue of events with a new understanding from these data points on location and source. Importantly, the impacts are critical for refining Mars's timeline. You see, impacts are the clocks of the solar system. By knowing the impact rate today, scientists can estimate the age of different surfaces. They can approximate the age of a planet's surface simply by counting its impact craters. On Mars, for example, the surface has had more time to accumulate impact craters of various sizes. That's because the planet lacks the tectonic plate movements and active volcanism that constantly renews the surface of the Earth. By calibrating statistical models based on how often they see impacts occurring now, scientists can estimate how many more impacts would have been happening earlier in the solar system's history. This is space-time. Still to come... 
Rocket Lab launches its seventh electron orbital mission this year, and later in the science report, a new mask that can alert the wearer if they've been exposed to COVID-19. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Rocket Lab has launched its 30th mission and delivered its 150th satellite into orbit. The ARL Spreads Its Wings mission was flown aboard an electron rocket from Launch Complex 1B at the Mahia Peninsula Spaceport on New Zealand's North Island East Coast. LD to all stations on mission. From now on, there should be no red flags on your critical LCCs. VCON, LD mission. LD VCON. Confirm all expected flight computer ASGOs are green. Confirm ASGOs are green. And please lock the auto sequence and confirm. Confirmed auto sequence is locked. Hey, we are go for auto sequence start. LD is go for launch. LD shadow, confirm, go for launch. LD shadow is go for launch. Vehicle is switched to internal power. All ground power disabled. Vehicle is fully on internal power. AFT is green and enabled for flight. Locks load complete. Lock system in recirculation. All helium anti geysering disabled. Stage one and stage two tanks are pressed. High flow engine purge enabled. Water deluge is activated. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one. Stage one propulsion. Is Our thirtieth electron has taken to the skies, having successfully lifted off the pad at Launch Complex One. The next critical stage in electrons' flight is Max Q, maximum aerodynamic pressure. This is when the vehicle's velocity and local air density are at their maximum, and the vehicle experiences the most mechanical stress. Q at max Q. Electron has successfully passed through max Q and at an altitude of just over 15 kilometers is well on its way to pass the Kármán line and enter orbit. The nine sea level Rutherford engines on the first stage are operating nominally and we are approaching the next series of events in the mission. The first step after max Q is MECO or main engine cutoff when those first nine engines throttle down before shutting off completely. This slows the vehicle marginally before the first stage separates from the vehicle. Once this is complete, the second stage space optimized Rutherford engine ignites to take the payload and kick stage the rest of the way into orbit. Oh, is it Jettons? MECO confirmed. Stage separation successful. Done, done, and done. With that, we've confirmed MECO, stage separation, and ignition of the space-optimized Rutherford engine on the second stage. At this point, as Electron has cleared most of Earth's atmosphere, it can also jettison the payload fairing, as it is no longer needed to protect the payload. Electron's second stage is continuing nominally on its way to orbit, carrying its inspective payload, which is now exposed in preparation of deployment. The vehicle is currently reaching speeds of more than 8,000 kilometers per hour and at an altitude of 131 kilometers. The vehicle is continuing nominally on its flight to low Earth orbit, currently traveling at a speed of over 9,000 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 140 kilometers. We're now almost five minutes into the mission for the OWL spreads its wings, our electron flight for Synspective. The vehicle with payload is traveling at a speed of over 11,000 kilometers per hour, currently at an altitude of 176 kilometers, well on its way to low Earth orbit. The low Earth orbit zone, often noted as LEO, is classified by having an apogee of less than 2,000 kilometers, or approximately 1,200 miles. Next up is a step we refer to as the battery hot swap. The Rutherford is a unique engine in that it is powered by electric pumps, which draw energy from batteries. Once those batteries are depleted, they're just dead weight, so we shed them to swap out for a fresh one. HVP battery discharge holding nominal, reaching hot swap in roughly 30 seconds. Throttling down. Battery hot swap has been successfully completed and a new battery is powering the second stage onto orbit. Battery discharge, holding nominal. Electron is currently at an altitude of 206 kilometers, traveling at a speed of over 19,000 kilometers per hour on its way to space. While this particular mission is not a recovery mission, our recovery program is progressing at speed, with the first test of a recovered Rutherford engine just two weeks ago, and it was a roaring success. We're looking forward to the next 30 minute missions and beyond, perhaps even flying fully reusable hardware to improve sustainability and value for our customers. The next major milestone we're approaching is second engine cutoff, or SECO. Just like Miko, our space-optimized Rutherford engine on the second stage will throttle down ahead of separation from the kick stage, which takes the payload to exactly where it needs to go. Guidance is in total. SECO confirmed. Nominal transfer orbit. 
You may have heard the call there. The vacuum-optimized Rutherford engine has throttled down, and the kickstage has cleanly separated from the second stage. From here, the small but mighty Curie engine will take the payload to its exact destination in space. For the next 50 minutes or so, the kickstage will enter a coast phase until it reaches the apogee of its elliptical orbit, the furthest distance away from Earth. From here, the Curie engine kicks in to adjust its perigee to a circular orbit at this point. Once it reaches the orbit our customer has requested, we'll deploy Inspective's Strix-1 satellite to its new home in space. The flight carried the Japanese Strix-1 Earth observation satellite, which was placed into a 563-kilometer high orbit. It'll join two other Strix satellites, launched by Rocket Lab in February this year and December 2020, as part of Inspective's Earth observation satellite constellation. The Isle Spreads Its Wings is Rocket Lab's seventh electron launch this year. The company is now working towards recovering a spent electron rocket first stage in midair using a helicopter. That's all part of plans to make the electron reusable. Also on the agenda is the first electron flight from Rocket Lab's new Launch Complex 2 at NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic Coast. And development work continues on Electron's new reusable neutron rocket. Well, as if police and emergency services in Northern England, Scotland and Northern Ireland weren't busy enough last week with the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, they were also being inundated with hundreds of calls about a strange fireball crossing the sky. The British Meteor Network says some 800 people reported seeing the fiery streak that looked like a meteor heading northwest across the sky and was visible for about 20 seconds. Some witnesses reported seeing the object break apart. However, Meteor Network astronomer John McLean says the fireball was travelling too slowly to be a meteor and was most likely simply a piece of space junk. You see, most meteors typically enter the Earth's atmosphere at speeds of around 80,000 km per hour, whereas space junk will be travelling at orbital speeds of around 28,000 km per hour when it hits the atmosphere. So, a meteor would cross the sky in a matter of seconds, whereas space junk is usually visible for much longer in this case matching the reports of it being visible for 20 seconds. Preliminary trajectory calculations by the International Meteor Organization suggest the space debris would have landed in the Atlantic Ocean just south of the Hebrides. McLean suggests that the object was possibly a Starlink satellite, which was due to be deorbited and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at around that time. But because the top of the Earth's atmosphere tends to expand and contract depending on the solar wind strength, it may have commenced its orbit slightly early. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists have created a new mask that can alert the wearer if they've been exposed to COVID-19 or influenza after a 10-minute conversation with an infected person. The sensor attached to the mask can respond to as little as 0.3 microliters of liquid containing viral proteins. That's between 70 and 560 times less than the volume of liquid produced in one sneeze and much less than the volume produced by coughing or talking. The team designed a small sensor with synthetic molecules that can identify unique proteins or pathogens. A report in the journal Matter says the scientists modified a multi-channel sensor to simultaneously recognize surface proteins on SARS-CoV-2, H5N1 and H1N1. Once the sensor binds to target proteins in the air, an ion-gated transistor will amplify the signal and alert the wearer through their cell phone within 10 minutes. We all know that water comes in three phases, solid, liquid and gas. Or does it? Scientists at the University of Cambridge have discovered that water in a one-molecule-thick nanolayer acts like neither a liquid nor a solid and becomes highly conductive at high pressures. A report in the journal Nature used computer simulations to demonstrate this unusual behaviour, detecting several new phases of water at the molecular level. The authors found that water, which is confined in a one-molecule-thick layer, goes through several phases, including a hexatic phase, during which water acts as neither solid nor liquid but something in between, and a superionic phase, which occurs at higher pressures and makes water highly conductive, propelling protons quickly through ice in a way resembling the flow of electrons in a conductor. 
Understanding the behavior of water at the nanoscale is critical for understanding new technologies, including medical treatments, new highly conductive electrolytes for batteries, water desalination, and the frictionless transport of fluids. The results will not only help with understanding how water works at the nanoscale, but also suggest that nanoconfinement could be a new route for understanding supersonic behaviour in other materials. Paleontologists in Canada have discovered the remains of what may be the largest and most complete mummified dinosaur ever found. Scientists at the University of Reading have identified the exposed right hind foot and tail of a juvenile duck-billed hadrosaur that died somewhere between 77 million and 75 million years ago. Hadrosaurs are often described as the cows of the age of dinosaurs, roaming the late Cretaceous in vast herbivorous herds. While adults commonly grew to more than 10 metres in length, this juvenile is thought to have been around 4 metres long. The remains were found protruding out of a hillside in Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta. Paleontologists say early indications suggest that this animal, complete with intact fossilised skin and scales as well as tendons, may be extremely well preserved, with hopes that some of the internal organs might have been preserved as well, thereby providing new insights into what hadrosaurs really look like. Scientists say it'll take months of painstaking work to carve out the block of stone containing the fossil while also protecting the already exposed segments. The stone will then go to the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology where researchers will work painstakingly to carefully expose the rest of the fossilised remains from the surrounding matrix. South Australia has always been referred to as the creepy state. And now we know why. It seems South Australia is full of haunted houses and buildings with reputations for murder and death and strange sightings. One property near Taylor Bend on the other side of the Adelaide Hills is reputed to have had no less than seven strange deaths. Close to the city, Port Adelaide also has a history of creepy stories and unusual deaths. Then there's a ward at the Glenside Hospital dating back to 1855 which housed the state's most violent and criminally insane patients. And there are several buildings right in the Adelaide city centre which have a history of ghostly sounds and sightings. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says it's fascinating to see how a place can build up a reputation that may not always be deserved. Adelaide is the capital. It's, it's a nice place. It's called the, the City of Churches. It's kind of a nice pleasant place. It's got a bit of a nice background. But someone's put up a list of the most haunted places in, or the most twisted murder mysteries and overall scary, is what they call it, places in South Australia. Now, you get these lists all the time, and you probably, if you got a second list of the five most murder mysteries and overall scary places in South Australia, you might find different ones. This list that we're looking at now has five different places. Two of them are actual towns. One's called Old Talem Town. That has some old buildings dating back to the 1890s. And there's been several deaths associated with it. And again, there's always deaths associated with places. I don't know if they're particularly creepy. I've been to Old Talem. I've been there a number of times. So I wanted to have a few spirits at the local pubs, but never a ghost. Uh, 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 uh. I've never been. I didn't even know where Old Talem is. I it's must just admit. near Talem Bend on the Murray River. Oh, is it? Okay, down that way. Okay. Anyway, Port Adelaide is the other city which had a number of brutal deaths. Any any big place is going to get brutal deaths at some stage or another. A lot of little places get brutal deaths too. But yeah, there was a particular story of a body of a Chinese sailor which was found floating in the river wrapped in a sack with three nails in his head. And that, that's pretty pretty impressive for a scary story. They don't say much about where exactly in Port Adelaide you go to be scared. And maybe just everywhere you go in the town. Then there's an arcade, a shopping arcade in Adelaide, which is said to be the most haunted building in the CBD. Then there's a um, former mental asylum, which is supposed to be the most haunted building or something. Then there's a, a what's now a, uh, a store, a clothing store, I think it is, in the main pedestrian mall of uh, Adelaide, and that's the most haunted shop or something. Everything's the most, the most haunted town, the most haunted building, the most haunted hospital, that sort of thing. So you don't want any mediocre haunting places here. So if you go to Adelaide, if you go to South Australia, you can visit the town, Old Talem Town and Port Adelaide, or go around shopping in the middle of Adelaide, and you're bound to bump into a ghost or two. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 